Houston, Texas is the fourth largest city in the union in the state where size most definitely matters. Texas is bigger than Germany, the UK, Ireland, the Netherlands, and Belgium put together. Everything's bigger in Texas is the boast in these parts, and for some, that extends to their waistline, too. You know, maybe they started out the everything's big in Texas with the guys. <laughs> you know, maybe that's how it started. It wasn't a big state, it was big people. And here in the Lone Star State, big people have brought Houston a dubious status. It's America's fattest city. Obesity in Texas has now been called public enemy number one by the medical profession. If you could call being fat an epidemic, it's an epidemic. While a staggering two-thirds of Texans are overweight and a third are obese, many of them have no intention of slimming down. I am not making any effort to lose weight, just to lose weight. So just how have these larger-than-life Texans ended up being so big? And what is it about Texas that produces the fattest people in the fattest country in the world? Although obesity is raging throughout the entire United States, it's the southern states like Texas that tip the scales more than most. In a nationwide study by a men's fitness magazine, Houston has been named and shamed as the fattest city for three years running. Ordinary Houstonians reveal just what it is about the Texan lifestyle and attitudes that's turned this place into a land of giants. Wide-eyed, slack-jawed visitors to the state are often shocked by the sight of so much wobbling, waddling weight. But in Texas, fat is normal. One of the reasons they are the fattest is they just don't care. I've always been comfortable with my size. I've been large all of my life, but I come from a family of large people, and that was normal. So. I never had a problem with my size or, or self-esteem. Linda is just five foot four, but weighs 275 pounds. She's making a life-sized wireframe model of herself and was shocked to realize just how big she'd become. I thought, oh my goodness, look at the size of her. <laughs> and I asked my husband, does that really look like me? And he said, you're right on target. It's just right there. I don't comprehend size in my mind, I think. You know, I, I read about people who are anorexic, who look in the mirror and see a fat person. Well, I, maybe I have the, the opposite. You know, I don't see this, I don't see this size person when I look in the mirror by any means. So I, so when I saw her in 3D, it was just like, wow, <laughs> now that's a fat person. Diane weighs in at 625 pounds. She too makes no apologies for her size. When I look back on both sides of the family, there is a lot of obesity. Granted, I'm the largest of everybody, but at the same time, you ask me, I'm the prettiest. The standard measurement used for obesity is the body mass index, or BMI, a calculation of a person's weight in kilograms divided by the square of their height in meters. A healthy BMI should be between 19 and 24. Diane's is over 100. That puts her in the super, super morbidly obese class. She can no longer walk and needs constant attention from her home help, Lee. I don't really look at her size. You know, I, I look with the person as herself. What I would never do would tell her or ask her, you know, Diane, would you ever think about losing weight? I would never do that because, as I say, she's a beautiful person, just like she is. Just because you're fat doesn't mean that you're not attractive. In this shot, I was wearing a one-piece cat suit, which is stretch lace from shoulder down to ankle, nothing underneath it. I see myself in this as someone who is very comfortable in her own skin, someone who accepts herself 
and makes no apologies to anybody and also accepts the fact that, yes, she can be sensual. Many Texans take a pride in their supersize. They are famously competitive, and if they can't be the biggest, they want to be the best, even in the area of wanton gluttony. I've done a lot of things in my life where I've raced cars and I've raced motorcycles and boats, and I could never win at anything. You know, so I figured one thing I do know I can do is eat. So I eat, and I, this is my accomplishments. I have no trophies here for boat racing, none for car racing, but I do get them for eating. I am an eating machine. Bud's prodigious appetite as a competitive eater may be extraordinary, but carrying 100 pounds of excess weight like he does is absolutely nothing out of the ordinary in Houston. If you look at my size, you'll see probably, I'd say a good 30% of the men in Houston or in Texas, not just Houston, are about my size. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of big, but, you know, I still get up, go to work, and I can enjoy myself. You know, there's nothing I have limitations on doing, being as big as I am. But Diane sees one rule for big men and another for big women. In Texas, it seems that men of size, it's hunky-dory. It's okay. You know, they're chunky, they're muscular. I mean, how many fat men do you see with rolls of fat in their muscles? Their beer bellies hanging over their pants because they can't pull their pants up. For men, it's acceptable to be fat. Women, it's not. Diane is meeting her friend Kathy. It's an opportunity to bemoan the unfair judgment she gets. Hi, how you ladies doing today? Yeah. Fine. Good, Thanks. I got some chips and salsa here for you. I look in the mirror and there's nothing wrong with who I am or what I look like, if you open your mind. It's the tunnel vision minded person who can't accept me because I know that I dress well for, what I, for what's available in my size. I, feel like I look good, and if I feel good in what I'm wearing, I know I'm presenting myself well. Part of it also goes back to if you feel good, you're going to look good. And if you're smiling with a happy face, you don't look your age, but if you're real sad and got the mully grubs, you age yourself. So many of the gentlemen I've met through the personals in that mm -hmm. sincerely seem to think I should be just grateful to go out on a date. They seem to think that because of my size, I'm willing to be treated any which way or willing to do anything. I mean, just because I'm large doesn't mean I don't have morals, I don't have feelings. And I wish, you know, that they would take that into consideration. We're human too. That's true. There are a lot of men that just are predators. Yes. Uh. Many are in denial about their weight problem, perhaps because the reasons for it will challenge almost everything about the comfortable lifestyle they've created. Does the Texan way of life come with too high a price to pay, the epidemic of obesity? Coming up, food, glorious food, as Bud makes short work of some monster meals. It's unbelievable. <laughs> The prime suspect in the Texan lifestyle that causes so much obesity in Houston is food, enormous amounts of food. Champion Eater Bud starts his day with a few appetizers. Thank you. Yeah, we start the day usually with three donuts, and then about 10 o'clock we'll stop and what a burger and have uh, a what a burger, and after that we'll have lunch about one o'clock.
But it's not all fast food in America's fattest city. The temptations to eat in Houston are vast and varied. It's one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the States, with a wealth of international cuisines competing for Texans food dollars. We'll cook it for another 30 minutes. Let so, the cheese uh, melt on it. Um, um, in Texas, everything revolves around eating. You are not a Texan unless you love barbecue. You must be a beef eater. You have to love food, period. Be it Italian, Chinese, Mexican, everything revolves around eating. And Texans have a keen eye for a bargain when it comes to food. Bud especially will rise to a challenge if he can score a free meal. Today, they got uh, the free 32-ounce uh, steak, if you can eat it. What it is, a chicken fried steak, breaded, mashed, or potatoes, salad. If you can do it, it's free. This is 32 ounces plus breaded. So we're going to give it a try today and see what happens. The big problem with food in Houston is not that it's bad, it's just there's so much of it. Linda and her husband are meeting friends at a restaurant that, like most in this city, serves humongous portions. While this is seen as great value for money, Linda admits she doesn't know when she's eaten enough. I don't understand that satisfied feeling. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I can't don't grasp full. that concept yet. I don't know full. I don't, I don't know Linda, how to do your that. siblings big people? All, they're, we're all the same. We're all big, heavy people. Oh my goodness, look how oh, big look that, that is. I'm glad you ordered the small. I know. <laughs> because of supersizing, a portion of French fries has gone from 200 calories in the 60s to more than 600 calories today. It seems price and value matter more than taste and presentation. When we moved to Texas in 1973, if you went in to get a big, that would be a big meal. Mm -hmm. That would be a really big meal. Somewhere in the 80s, some marketing scheme said, let's raise the price of the meal, but let's give them more food. Don't give them expensive food, give them cheap stuff, beans and rice and whatever. But, oh, and lots of bread. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember that until maybe the 80s. But I don't know when platters got so big, because I'm, I'm taught. I've been taught to eat as much as is on that plate. Everything on that plate has to go. Regardless of how hungry someone is, it's been shown that supersizing portions makes people eat more. Not that Bud needs much encouragement as he finishes his 32-ounce steaks. Do you want a dessert, brownie, or pecan pie? No, thank you. Thank you, you did awesome. Would that be free though? I would hope that it would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't go too bad. You know, 24 minutes, not as good as I expected, but it was a free dinner. Not everyone is complacent about obesity. Someone who has had enough of being fat is 34-year-old Tiffany. She remarried in 2002 and has since taken stock of how she wants to look. Looking good and feeling good is very important to me because, I mean, it tells a lot about you. I don't want to go through life being uncomfortable and miserable. I'm just tired. I'm just, I really just want to enjoy the rest of my life. Like in a way I kind of feel like, not that I missed out on all my 20s, but I could have maybe been so much more 
have done so much more if I didn't have the weight kind of holding me back. This is just a dress that I got for Christmas, maybe two Christmases ago from my mom. And I never could fit it. And I just want to know and know what it feels like to be able to put it on. I have a lot of clothes in my closet like that. Obesity is far from being merely a cosmetic issue. It's directly responsible for a long list of today's most common and costly medical problems, from diabetes to heart disease. And it's getting worse, with obesity figures going up by 1% every year. Unable to stick to a diet, Tiffany has decided to take a drastic, high-tech, high-risk route to stop gaining weight. She's going to have her stomach stapled in an operation that could kill her. I would say the main reason for me wanting the surgery, I mean, to look good, of course, but to mainly to be healthier so I can have many more days here on Earth with my son, and then it can give me the energy that I need for him to work with him to get the weight off of him also. Tiffany's son, Jordan, has a fat problem, too. He's already 168 pounds with a BMI of 32. That makes him obese. And he's not alone. 35% of Texan school children are overweight. I'm 11 years old, and I weigh around 167 to 169, and I should weigh 95 to 100. At some points, I really do wish I was skinnier. They sometimes pick on me about it, and I really hate it, and that's why I'm trying to lose weight. If I grow up to be big, I probably really don't want to, and if I grow up to be skinny, I'll be happier. Jordan's best friend is Johnny, who accepts him just the way he is. He's big, but like, the, what my mom says he dresses nice, and that's what makes him look better than most big people. And I say, if you dress nice, then that's just like saying that, hey, you're not that fat. Since his metabolism is faster, then he can eat more than me without gaining more than five pounds. Well, he's my best friend. I don't care if he eats all my food. My mom likes that he eats, but I don't really eat. So I just give him all my extras or I give him my food. It's lunchtime for Jordan. Unhealthy meals served up in Texan schools have finally been recognized as contributing to juvenile obesity. Jordan School now makes healthier, low-fat versions of kids' fast food favorites without them realizing the difference. There's four different lines, and I usually go to those three lines, those three lines right there, and then that's what I usually get with pizza, chicken nuggets, stuff like that. For years, schools have boosted their incomes in partnerships with the fast food giants. In Houston, it's estimated that schools get $2 million a year from vending machine sales alone. Jordan School has recently insisted on having only low sugar drinks. Many don't. The rise of obesity among Texan school children is alarming. Severe obesity-related diseases are being found in children younger than ever before. There's now a growing fear that this is the first generation which may have shorter lifespans than its parents. Average Houstonian eats 3,800 calories a day. The problem is they need less than 2,000 calories for the amount of activity they do. You do the math. Food junkie Bud has moved on to one of Houston's many all-you-can-eat restaurants for his evening fix of food. What we have here is we have Diablo fajitas, which is uh, beef skirt, onions, green peppers, cheese and as you see we put the beans and the rice 
See how it tastes. Mm. It's good. Houstonians eat out more than people in any other city. And with the average cost of a meal being under $18, it's much cheaper than anywhere else. I eat out seven nights a week because it is cheaper for me to eat out. Um, this meal right here is $11 and I can eat all I want. If I was to make this meal at home, this meal would cost me anywhere from $25 to $40. Such cheap meals just encourage overeating as people scoff more to feel they're getting their money's worth. I come in here on Super Bowl Sunday at one o'clock. I don't leave here till seven o'clock. I eat from the time I get here till the time I get back. You know, this, it's unbelievable. But all you can eat one price restaurants weren't designed for the likes of Bud's appetite. I have been, been banned from two restaurants because that were all you can eat. Because like I say, they make their money on the people that can eat. I went through two complete prime ribs in four hours. They asked me if I would not come back again. You know, so I just don't understand. <laughs> it don't make sense. You know, it's all you can eat. Coming up, why the comfort and convenience of living in Texas is adding to the weight problem. I am probably one of the laziest men you'll ever find. Texans are fiercely proud of their state's history. For many, a connection with cowboys and a life outdoors is nostalgically kept alive in this era of air-conditioned comfort. Living in the rural outskirts of Houston, Richard enjoys the best of all worlds. I think I probably fit pretty close to the image of a Texan. Uh, I think Texans are just uh, good old boys. I enjoy the city and the nice restaurants and all that, but uh, I prefer to come out here and sit around the fire and have a cold beer and eat a steak. My body image is old and fat, <laughs> old and chunky, I'm comfortable with it. I mean, I'm, I can still do things and, and um, I'm still pretty limber for a fat boy. The cult of bigness doesn't stop at supersized meals. In Texas, big is beautiful. Bigger is better, I guess. And maybe that might be a little Texas phrase there, but bigger is definitely better. Richard's invited some friends over to his house for a barbecue. Big pickup trucks and beer bellies are very much the order of the day. While his friends chill in his backyard, Richard's hard at work in the kitchen. Like many ordinary Texans, he is a connoisseur of food and an enthusiastic amateur cook. I'm a regular guy to a point, but I just enjoy cooking very much, very much. You know, fast food, I think, is overrated. And I like the more exotic foods, I guess you could call it. And uh, I, I think it's much better to eat uh, a meal like I'm preparing right now than, than fast food any day. Uh, and it just doesn't take that long to do it. Never you trust a skinny, skinny barbecue cook. Nintendo 64, Nintendo 64 oh, games, and then an Xbox game, mm -hmm. and an Xbox. Okay. I love you. Like many busy Houstonians, Tiffany often takes the easy fast food option at the end of the day and orders a carryout for herself and Jordan. She's easily seduced into ordering more than she needs. Like, you have what, a meat lovers? Can I have a large meat lovers pizza? Which one is the thick one? I want the thick one. 
Okay, that's what I want. Pan, pan pizza. Okay. Okay, so if I get one large meat lover's pizza, I can get a medium for $1.99. Okay, and a two liter drink. What kind of drink you have? Richard and his friends form the Chillin' and Grillin' competitive cooking team. In two days' time, they are going to take part in a big annual barbecue cook-off competition. They usually win it and have serious hopes for this year. Do y'all all think we can do it again? Do what? In, 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 in 94 till now, I don't think we haven't done it. Y'all think we can do it again? Okay. Our point is, we want to win. Oh, that's all we want to win. We have honor at stake. Major. Tiffany and Jordan are making quick work of their supersized TV dinner. Studies show that the greater the time spent watching TV, the fatter the kid. Four hours a day is not uncommon. And if there's one thing Houstonians do exceedingly well, it's sitting, and therein lies a problem. Houston is a city built in homage to the automobile. The Texan oil boom encouraged an enormous web of freeways across the city. New evidence shows that the greater the urban sprawl, the more people have to drive. The less they walk, and the heavier they become. It's as if the city itself should come with a health warning. It, it's so sprawled out over so big of, a, of an area, I, I just don't think, I don't see how everybody could walk or even the majority could walk in, in, a, in, a, in a way that would function in Houston, Texas. In Europe, people make a third of their trips on foot or by bicycle. In the U.S., it's less than a tenth. And in Houston, no one walks anywhere if they can help it. There's a, a ladies' dress store, and they always are in a strip center, a, a strip of storefronts like, like, you know, what we're passing here. That way, large-sized ladies can drive up to their door, get out, and walk 10 feet. And if everything was like that, oh, what a wonderful world it would be for all of us who don't want to get out there and just walk and walk and walk. A generation ago, 70% of children walked or cycled to school. These days, it's less than 20%. Jordan couldn't walk to his school safely even if he wanted to. The surrounding suburbs have no sidewalks. Linda doesn't even let her son walk to the bus stop. We're sitting here. I, we're not far from the school bus. Not the school bus, but the stop sign. That's where the school bus picks the children up for school in the morning and drops them in the afternoon. And in the morning, we drive them to the bus stop. <laughs> and it is, well, it's a good, what, 50 feet down there? <laughs> We can find many ways to justify driving to the corner, but it's, it's what we do. I am probably one of the laziest men you'll ever find. I will not walk to the mailbox unless I have to. If I want to go get the mail, I'll wait till I have to go somewhere in the car and then I'll stop by the mailbox and pick up the mail. And the mailbox is about 20 feet from the house. And that it is pretty sad that I don't walk that far. Part of the reason why they don't want to leave the comfort of their air-conditioned cars is the weather. For much of the year, Houston is unbearably hot and humid. But when it rains, it pours. and then floods.
Live from KPRC Channel 2, where local news comes first. The rain doesn't dampen spirits, as Richard and his teammates appear on local TV as star cooks. If it rains at the cook-off tomorrow, Richard won't be deterred either. I like the harsh weather. We cook in snow, ice, it doesn't matter. We just keep on doing our job and fill ourselves up with whiskey for antifreeze, and we're in, we're in the house. We'll do great. Coming up, the day of Tiffany's operation arrives. I just thought, wow, this is where they're going to do it. And it's the moment of truth for Richard. These are right on. That's about as good as you're going to ever see. You're going to get sick if you drink too much. With Tiffany's operation tomorrow, she's having a final checkup with her surgeon, Eric Wilson. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take your stomach, we're going to divide it into two pieces. The upper piece is going to be a very small piece, about um, uh, 20 cc's or 20 cubic centimeters, um, a little bit less than an ounce, yeah, about the size of a racquetball or less. Um, we're going to completely divide the stomach in two, and then we're going to cut the intestine down below and, and bring up a limb of intestine to that pouch so when you eat, the food um, um, goes through the small pouch and into the intestine and down into the rest of your intestine to help digest the food. It's 0.5 to 1% chance of dying from the operation, and we don't consider that a small number. That's actually a pretty high number to us. But there's no getting away from the fact that due to these problems, it, you could die from the operation. I guess I'm a little nervous, but I'm more anxious and excited. I just am. I just, you know, I have I have faith in you all, and I have faith, period, and I just feel like everything's gonna go fine. Food. Tiffany's surgery is a major operation, and the high risks can't be overlooked. Diane had it, and had to have it reversed. I had the surgery, I weighed 404 pounds, I lost 150 in 10 months, I no longer could swallow, and that's when we found out the surgery was very drastically wrong. I had to have five corrective surgeries. I now have lifetime complications, which there are no answers for. And now here I am 15 years later, 240 pounds more than I had been. I've been there, I've done that, and I burned the t-shirt. I don't wanna go there again, I will not go there again. Diane gets upset when people make suggestions about her losing weight. Pressure to me is like on my birthday when my family handed me a cutout from the newspaper and ad to have weight loss surgery and told me that was my gift. I can't take it anymore. I've already tried to change my life to suit y'all. I'm happy with who I am. Y'all are not. Maybe you need the attitude adjustment. Surgery is the last ditch option open to just the morbidly obese. For everyone else, the answer lies in exercise and diet control. Jordan's at a football game with his grandma. He sprained his wrist, but that's not the only reason he's not able to burn off some calories in the team today. There's a certain weight limit for some reason, and it's 155. But see, I'm over that because I weigh 167, so I'm not able to play. You understand? Yes, right here. If you have boys that are out there, you know, you, you have 10, 11 year old boys and sometimes 12 year old boys that weigh 170, 180, they're gonna hurt somebody. Handle it! I mean, he's already the weight of a grown man. He's been at practice and he's been working at practice. He's had no choice but to work at practice. And he's done a good job at practice. During the training, I lost 10 pounds. Jordan's grandma is keen he doesn't end up fat like his mother. But I kind of pushed the football issue with my daughter because I wanted, I, Jordan had to get active. 
You know, I don't want him to grow up to be uh, a fat kid. I'm gonna cut back. We're gonna, t we're starting Weight Watchers Monday, him and I together. She's starting Weight Watchers. And he's coming with me. The diet industry in the U.S. has grown fat as Americans spend to shed their weight. Every year, some $33 billion goes on weight loss products and services. But many Texans are fatalistic about diets. My first diet, I was eight years old. And at eight years old, I weighed 133 pounds, and I can remember that very clearly. It took me a year to lose 30 pounds and two weeks to put it back on. That's all it took. Since then, I've been on that same program five other times, never successfully, obviously. Uh, matter of fact, I've even gained weight on it a few times. You know, it's kind of like a roller coaster diet. You can go on a diet, you can lose weight, and then you're gonna turn around and you're gonna be back up to where you were. Myself, I go down to 220, then next thing you know, I start eating again, and I'm back up to 265, and I have lost weight eight, 10 times. You know, I guess it was just meant for me to be this size. And that's why I am the way I am. Tiffany knows that she needs Jordan's help if he's to avoid being a fat adult. But you agree there are some things you could do yourself that would help you lose weight. Yeah. When I'm not around. The, the choices that you make on food and stuff when I'm not around, right? Yes, but it's real hard. Mm -hmm. But you're going to be all right. Because once mommy start feeling better, me and you going to do more things and you can get active, more active than you are now, and you'll start losing weight too. See, you're still young, so you got time. And it's better to do it now. I'm sure once you start liking girls more, you'll really be trying to get it off, huh? I like girls now. Well, more. What girls you like? That's confidential. Confidential. <laughs> Tiffany is confident that the risk of her operation is worth taking. I don't listen to any negativity about the surgery. I just, I really, you know, from other people, that's something I really don't want to hear. I've come this far, so it's time now. God, we gotta pray to God real quick. Let's pray to God real quick. Did we pray right now? I ask you to take and watch over my daughter, keep her safe, and through these doctors' hands, let thy will be done. Amen. Amen. Go give her another kiss. I remember uh, my son crying. I was feeling good. I was feeling like almost happy, you know, not because he was crying, but just because my medicine had start working and I was looking like why are you crying you know and I was I didn't feel sad or anything she's gonna be fine honey she's coming back just in a couple hours okay we'll check on her for you and I'll let you know how she's doing I just thought wow this is where they're gonna do it it was kind of informal. I don't know, I guess I expected something else, but uh, I, I had a lot of faith in my doctor, so I just, I just laid there and relaxed, and I guess before I knew it, I was out. Meanwhile, it's the Harris County Fair and Rodeo, and Richard's barbecue team get ready for their long-awaited cook-off competition. If your idea of a barbecue is a few sausages and burgers in the backyard, think again. 
This is barbecue on a Texan scale. 70 teams, all serious, mostly big guys. If you go to a cook-off and you holler, hey, fat boy, you're gonna have about 600 guys turn around and look at you. I would say the average cooking team is about the same weight as the average NFL line on weight, maybe offense. <laughs> Tiffany's operation is part of a trend. This year, weight loss surgery rates are up 50% on last year's figures. There's a whole laundry list of uh, health-related problems tied to morbid obesity. You know, those include high blood pressure, diabetes, um, coronary artery disease or heart disease, um, other vascular disease such as stroke or peripheral vascular disease. These surgeries have not proven definitively yet. It hasn't. There's not enough. Um, information out there yet to prove that we're causing people to live longer by doing this operation as opposed to leaving them fat. Um, but we do know that we are curing a lot of the, the major problems associated with obesity. You need a spatula? Yeah. Give me the spatula, spatula. big one. Okay, At the cook-off, cook it's time for Richard yeah. to select the barbecued ribs and brisket to be judged. It's a serious business. These are right at the edge. These are right on. That's about as good as you're gonna ever see. That's a good looking rib. They're gonna be looking for tenderness of the aroma and the taste and how we actually put it into the tray for they want it to look good. This one's, this one's really maybe close to OD. Oh, God damn, it looks good though. Oh, oh man, yeah. look at that smoke oh. ring. We try to get that ring in there and that's all done through smoke alone. What we strive for in every cook-off we do we want first place. We'll be in the top three. Hopefully. I think we'll make the top these three. Are, these are at least top threes, I'm, I'm hoping. They look like it to me. Bam! Knock the bones. We didn't do it too hard, did we? Coming up, Richard's tense at the cook-off results. Tiffany's family are tense also as they wait for news from the operation. And Bud tackles his biggest ever burger. accepted another food challenge, this time to eat a monster burger. Those who manage it, and many have tried, get their picture on the wall of fame. Texas is a very, very competitive state. Anything that you compete in, they're gonna compete in. Bud's burger is being made with one and a half pounds of beef a pound of bacon, and a quarter pound of cheese, plus all the trimmings. It's an astonishing 5,000 calorie meal, enough to sustain him for two and a half days. At the cook-off, it's reckoning time for Richard's barbecued ribs and brisket. You're gonna be judging on four different criteria. One is aroma. Does it smell like what you think they should smell like? Two is color. Next one's texture. Is it tough? Is it tender? Is it dry? Is it moist? Last but not least is taste. This is why Texas is the way it is. People want to be challenged. So they'll come in here and they'll eat this. Not everybody will eat it, but they'll give it a good try. As Tiffany's operation continues, her family are waiting anxiously. She is my greatest love, you know. 
She's truly the love of my life. For me, there's nobody else but her. And I have thought, you know, what if something goes wrong? But I just don't believe this is how she wants to live her life. She says she wants to start rollerblading with me, and as soon as this cast comes off, I'm going right back to the speed bump. I don't know if my mom will be there yet, but she's going to try. This high-tech operation can cost up to $50,000, and only a very few insurance companies are prepared to bear the cost of it. The insurance companies see the problem, you know, they see that one in 40 Americans qualify for this operation. Based upon that, um, they see themselves not being able to afford to pay for all these operations. And the question that is raised by the insurance company is, well, is it more cost effective to leave people fat or to, to make them thin with this operation? It has risks, you know, there can be problems with the operation. But then you've got to balance it with how much does it cost to take care of diabetes? How much does it cost to, to give them medications for high blood pressure? And what, what are the costs of, of having the diseases? I mean, how much does it cost for a heart attack? finishes his burger in just 20 minutes, well ahead of his competitors. 20 minutes and 46 seconds. <laughs> not bad, not bad at all. The only thing that got me with the onions. And all for the glory of his photo on the wall of fame. Yeah. Congratulations. At the cook-off results, Richard's team are disappointed not to have won anything in the ribs category and are apprehensive as all that remains now is to announce the winning brisket number. Eight, three, nine, eight. Eight, three, nine, eight. Oh. Eight, three, nine, eight. <laughs> Richard takes his defeat on the chin. Disappointed, yes, but you can't win them all. So, I don't know what it was, but this point a little bit, but we'll, we'll uh, have a big party tonight. Tiffany's operation is over and appears to have been a success. Hey, Tiffany, it's Dr. Wilson. You okay? We're done, you did good. I felt somebody on the side of me like, hey, wake up, wake up. And I was like, and then when I heard him, and I was coming too, I was like, the first thing that came to my mind was, thank God I woke up. After three years of being called the fattest city in America, Houston is now slowly realizing that its life of comfort and convenience comes with a high price to pay. Conservative estimates put a figure of $4 billion a year on the medical costs of obesity in Texas alone. Back home, Tiffany's pleased. I feel good now. I'm glad it's over with. But I'm, I'm glad that I did it. I'm glad that I did it. I'm glad it's over with. And now I can start, you know, maybe putting a new life together for myself. As far as my son goes, Jordan goes, I mean, basically, what I did was for both of us because I want to focus on getting him on the right track and I want him to have confidence. I want him to know that having confidence makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> Some people in the fattest city are just never going to change. As far as being the fattest city and people looking at us as fat, I don't really think that, you know, I'm ashamed. You know, it's, it's how you feel inside with what you are. If you are heavy and you're 
okay with it, it's fine. I'm a very good person. I like who I am. And I'm not going to change myself for society. And anyone who really thinks I should or starts trying to put pressure on me to change can simply bite me.